Uh, we do record it, and the primary reason we record it is because it helps us fill in the blanks. We know some information, we know some of the stories, but you know some of the stories also. And so uh, that helps us to flesh out and make it a richer community and a more valuable community because of the things that we learned about how everybody has interacted and contributed to the community. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chuck. We're going to... Okay, well, I'll start with this quote from the Times Herald. Uh, because it seems to uh, tell what we're trying to do here. And I paraphrase the first sentence of it. Every successful community has leaders like the 10 people we are about to see. Otherwise, they would not be <coughs> successful communities. But too often, the public takes little note in its enjoyment of what has been accomplished of the skill and effort and dedication that made the accomplishments possible. And that perhaps is as it should be because such leaders are not out for public accolades. They get their reward in seeing done what they know should be done for the well-being of all. And that was from an article in the Times-Herald in 1972. <laughs> and the first person that's going to uh, talk to, uh, give us a background tonight is Georgie Kloss Burns. Okay, I'm going to tell you about Father Kromenacher. Father Kromenacher was born in a house on Gratiot Avenue. It's no longer there, it was near the airport. He attended local schools and during his younger days he worked at several jobs. The Port Heron Times Herald, farmed, worked as a vendor in the Grand Trunk Railroad, postal clerk, carpenter, and lumberjack. He was said to be a math savant and could do math equations in his head. And this is a very young picture of him as a young man. He was ordained a priest in Detroit on July 6, 1902. He served in Detroit and Croswell before becoming the pastor of St. Mary's in St. Clair in the spring of 1917. In 1921, an addition was added to the church due to the rapidly growing congregation, which had increased by several hundred since he came with his broad vision and youthful pep. <coughs> Father Kromenacher was also known for his love of bowling. He would bowl at the little four-lane alley of Mickey Lightbody in the mornings or afternoons. One of our museum volunteers' mother would get the call to come and set pins for it. <laughs> he liked his Stroh's beer, and he'd call my grandfather on the phone, and he'd say, Bring me up a case of Stroh's, please. And he's driving. People knew enough to get out of the way when he was driving. Because he must have believed he had an angel on his shoulder. He never looked before pulling out of a parking lot. <laughs> that picture is um, Saunders. And the bowling alley is down to the right on Clinton Avenue. There was Ted Westry's beer store and Mickey Lightbody's Ice House in the four-lane bowling alley. We don't have a direct picture of it, but that's the corner of Clinton and Front Street. Bob Groff remembers when Father Kromenacher would have a funeral mass at St. Mary's. Then he would race to the cemetery, passing a long line of cars on Clinton Avenue, so he could beat all the rest of the people there. Needless to say, Bob and the rest of the altar boys were shaking in their boots in the back seat. <laughs> when Father Kromenacher was older, Joe Kim's father and Fred Amiel would go from school to the rectory and help Father get his shoes and coat on, then they'd take him for a walk. This was considered an honor to be chosen for to take him for his walks, and he'd tell stories all the time they were walking around the schoolyard. During his tenure at St. Mary's, Father Kromenacher oversaw the building of an addition to the church in 1920, a new school in 1940, and an addition to the school in 1959. Father Kromenacher retired in 1959 and served as pastor emeritus until his death. 
He received the honorary title of Right Reverend Monsignor from Pope Pius XII. <coughs> Anybody have any uh, stories they'd like to tell about uh, Father Kromenacher? Yes. I went to St. Mary's and uh, every, whenever we would get our report cards, he would come in and he would deliver the report cards. He'd just up in the front of the room and he'd call your name and he'd pick up your report card and he'd always say something to us. I thought that was always kind of neat. <laughs> Remember, John, sometimes he'd say, take the rest of the day off? Well, when, yeah, it, was, yeah. get when, when it, was, it was his birthday. Yeah. We all, if it was his birthday, he'd come in and he'd say, you can all go home. <laughs> and the nuns would have to sit and we'd have to go <laughs> Did you go home? Great. Yes. What, yes. what did the teacher do? What did the nun did nothing. I mean, Father, if Bond Senior said you could go home, you, were, you got to get out of school. <laughs> Sometimes when he'd hand out the report card, you'd go to grab it and he'd pull it back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was fun. <laughs> he was fun. Wasn't yeah. he? I was going to be in a I was asked to be in a wedding, and it was a non-Catholic wedding, and this was probably 19, just as he was retiring in 59. And my mother said, you have to go up and ask Father if you can be in the wedding, wedding party. So I went up, and I said, Nancy Stubbs is getting married, and she wants me to be a bridesmaid. You're not going to be a witness. I said, no. <laughs> You're just going to stand around in a dress. <laughs> You're certainly not going to be a witness. <laughs> Just going to wear a long dress. <laughs> yeah, you can be in way. <laughs> you got a special dispensation. Eh? <laughs> no, no, well, I could be in the way. <laughs> okay. Um, Katie, Katie Krebs is going to do uh, Franklin Moore Sr. Franklin H. Moore was born in St. Clair in 1907. He's, he was a graduate of Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts. He graduated from the University of Michigan and the Graduate School of Banking in Madison, Wisconsin. Mr. Moore began his banking career in 1930 with the first Detroit company, an investment banking affiliate of Detroit Bankers Company. In 1931, he and Alice D. Wolfe were married. They had four children, Franklin Jr., Margaret, Susan, and David. Alice Moore died in 1996, and the picture of Alice is on the left, and that's their first car, Alice and Frank's first car. Does anybody recognize what it is? Yeah. <laughs> They used to call them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Paul, 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 what kind of car is that? Yeah, what kind of car is that? Model A Ford. Ma that Model A? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Franklin Moore served as a captain in the United States Army Corps of Engineers during World War II. Franklin joined the Commercial and Savings Bank of St. Clair in 1934, becoming a cashier in 1936. In 1953, he was president and chairman of the board. He remained there for 37 years, providing banking services for, to customers throughout St. Clair County. During this period, the Commercial and Savings Bank Well, that was their biggest era of expansion. It, yeah, 1960s, 60s, yeah. Well, in the picture, he served as the director of the uh, old Detroit bank of the header, 60 to 66. Yeah. Yeah. In 1992, Mr. Moore retired from the Commercial and Savings Bank. His son, Franklin Jr., was appointed to succeed his father as president and CEO of the largest of the county's, county's largest local owned bank. <coughs> Frank was vice president of the Diamond Crystal Salt Company from 1953 to 1971 and chairman of the board from 1978 to 1982. He also had been a director of St. Clair Inn. 
Franklin H. Morris. Okay. Again, three. Franklin is uh, seniors. Many accomplishments included serving as president of the Michigan Bankers Association in 1958 to 1959. He was a charter member of the St. Clair County Community College Board of Trustees. He involved himself in the community of St. Clair in many ways. He served on the St. Clair School District Board of Education for 19 years before it merged with the East China School District. He was chairman of the St. Clair County Chapter of the American Red Cross. He was also involved with the Boy Scouts and the St. Clair Little League. He was a member of the St. Clair Rotary Club, serving as its president in 1947 in 1948. He was a trustee of the St. Clair Building Authority. He was also a trustee of several local foundations. He was instrumental in getting several million dollars in federal funding for the St. Clair Urban Renewal Project in the late 1960s. Franklin H. Moore Sr. died in 1982 at the age of 74. Anybody have any memories of, uh, of the senior Franklin Moore? I do. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm 17 years old, get out of high school, and Jimmy Ballar was going to sell me his 54 Ford for $300. And I didn't have $300. But I did have a job as a busboy at St. Clarette. So I went down and saw Franklin Moore, and he gave me a 90 day note for 300 bucks on a signature. <laughs> it didn't occur to me that you, you can't go borrow money from the bank if you're 17 years old and no job. <laughs> Very nice. Very but, nice. You know, he knew the family, so... <laughs> <laughs> if he couldn't get you, he could get your family then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else have anything they'd like to add? And banking relationships, usually a banker in town is a, is a key person and uh, is uh, quite influential. He was a gentleman. Yeah. He was a gentleman? Yes, he was. And you could get a loan and yep. just your signature and one paper to sign that was it. Yeah. <laughs> and one time, it wasn't he, but somebody that worked at the bank called and said, Helen, did Joe send in a check? <laughs> <laughs> she said, I think so. Why? Well, he just signed it, Joe. I'll put the last name. <laughs> Mr. Moore said it's okay. <laughs> That only happens in small towns. <laughs> they knew his joke. <laughs> yeah, you probably you probably can't do that uh, with Fifth Third these days. So. <laughs> okay, uh, Chuck. Chuck uh, Hamburg is going to do uh, Theo Eddy. Theodore Vietti was born on July 13, 1892 in Litchfield, Michigan. And he went to uh, the nearby Hillsdale College and graduated uh, in 1915. Uh, he was immediately hired as superintendent of the Litchfield schools. In 1928, uh, he earned his uh, master's degree from the University of Michigan. He eventually took graduate classes at Michigan State and Teachers College at Columbia University. When World War I came, uh, Theo served in the Army from 1918 to 1919. Uh, once he was home after the war, uh, he farmed for a year in the Litchfield area. The following year, he resumed his uh, career in education as a school superintendent in Camden, Michigan, and then in 1923 at Three Oaks, Michigan. So all schools in the southwest corner of Michigan. In 1930, the St. Clair School District hired uh, Theo Eddy as their superintendent. He remained in this position until he retired in 1957. 
and there's the high school in his office, I'm told, was in the front door to the right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's Mrs. Melbourne next to it. Yep. Yeah. Mr. Eddy was how Theo was always referred to in St. Clair. It was a matter of respect for a man of integrity and responsibility. He was known as a serious man, but one newspaper said that none smiled more broadly nor greeted more warmly. The St. Clair Elementary School was built under uh, his guidance uh, from 1938 to 1939. It in fact was a WTA project uh, in the latter years of the Depression. Uh, the school was later renamed the Theo B. Eddy Elementary School to honor the superintendent. Theo Eddy was a, a community leader. Upon coming to St. Clair, he joined the Rotary Club in 1930. He was chosen as their president in 1936. In 1968, the club gave him their Citizen of the Year Award. Theo and his family were members of the First Congregational Church. Theo served the city as a council member, chairman of the Planning Commission, chairman of the Beautification Commission. He was also chairman of the St. Clair Library Board when it was created in 1939. Uh, he was a trustee of the National Tuberculosis and Respiratory Disease Association and was president of the Michigan chapter. He was a busy man. Theo married Rose Southworth in 1918. She was a graduate of Hillsdale College as well, and was a teacher in Litchfield, Three Oaks, and in St. Clair. She also was the librarian at the St. Clair Library. Theo and Rose had four children, Paul, Ruth, Elaine, and Margaret. And there's a picture of Rose, which we had a very hard time finding and uh, pictures of the Eddy House on Trumbull Street. How it originally looked back when it was built in the 1870s and what it looks like now. Theo Eddy died in 1972 and rose in 1983. They were buried in Hillside Cemetery. The Times Herald in 1972 wrote of Theo B. Eddy, he was able to inspire others with his own visions and help them grasp the practicality of, their ide of his ideals. He was persuasive without being stern, forceful when necessary without being oppressive. He abhorred the pettiness and lowness to which local politics sometimes sinks and was above responding in kind. That is it for Theo Eddy. <coughs> Anybody uh, have any memories of uh, Mr. Eddy? Or? I gave the speech in 1957 at our high school graduation about his retirement, but I can't remember one word that I said. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Mary's <laughs> <ugly. laughs> I guess people didn't get called into the superintendent's no. office. Oh, they yes, they did. <laughs> <laughs> there was a whole group of us that were doing, we must, we must improve our, <laughs> and we got called in and we had to sit in the main hallway down there with our brand and I don't know who else, myself included. <laughs> Yeah. I got something too. Um, Go ahead. My parents are both teachers. We can't hear. Uh, we can't hear. We can't hear. Yeah. My parents are both teachers in the East China District after um, Mr. Eddy um, had retired when they started in 1960. And uh, they lived a block away from us. And when I was a young boy, I was probably about seven or eight years old, you know, he, was a, he was a family friend. So 
when I broke his basement window with my uh, <laughs> baseball and then he had hit, he didn't make me pay for it. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I, just, I just remember him as being very kind. I, mean, I, was, I was young when he passed away, but uh, I, re I remember the baseball. <laughs> oh, <laughs> your parents uh, my parents are Mike and Carol Craze. Oh, 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 okay. Yeah, we do. We teachers here. Any, anything else? Okay, we'll uh, we'll move on to uh, Frank Bowes and uh, Katie. Katie has memories of Frank Bowes. <laughs> Frank Bowes was a teacher extraordinaire. He was a favorite of most of the students. He was born January 9, 1921, in Elkhart, Indiana. He was so he was not a tiny baby, weighing oh in at 12 and a half pounds. Oh, wow. His mother was less than 100. Oh, wow. Frank had a typical boyhood with his younger brother Bud and cousin Bob. Frank had an accident while working at a sugar beet factory. He was working with huge grinders that ground up the beets to test the sugar content. He was in a hurry and attempted to help the process along by pushing the beet residue with his hand. He lost the ends of the th middle three fingers of his left hand. He was very self-conscious of his missing fingers. Now, this is Frank on the left. We're not sure um, who the other man is. I mean, on the right. Excuse me. Excuse me. If uh, anyone can identify, um, Bob Burgoyne. Oh, okay. Bob Burgoyne. Oh, yeah. They were college friends. College. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Frank never thought of going to college. His parents wouldn't be able to help him financially. However, due to his injury, the state paid for rehabilitation and college tuition wow. at Western Michigan University. Frank loved sports and wanted to become a coach. Both of his parents were good teachers and Frank excelled at whatever he did. In 1942, Frank entered the Army. Neither the loss of his fingers nor the loss of vision in one eye discovered in his youth was a deterrent to his entry into the Army. In time, he was promoted to corporal, and at this time, the loss of his vision was discovered and, was, and he was offered an early discharge or, dis, early discharge or lane pipe in war-torn Burma. He chose the early discharge. <laughs> After completing his college education, Frank was offered a teaching position at St. Clair High School. He started in 1948 as a ninth grade English teacher, basketball, football, and track coach. His teaching career spanned 37 years. Okay, for two here, he's a ward on the left, teaching in the school, in his classroom. Uh, he loved, uh, the faculty play in 1955, he loved performing. And the picture on the bottom left was a homecoming parade. In the picture, Frank is depicted as a female. And, and uh, Jeanette, Pine. Jeanette Pine, thank you, on the right as a male. And then the senior trip in 1960, and a fact, and uh, that's that's um, a sign we. Uh, were on strike, and for Frank to hold that sign was really something, because he did not believe in, in it, but um, he, took, he took over. Thank you. And that's, well, that's Sally. That's Sally. Oh, and then the, um, um, Lutz, yeah. Isabel Lutz and Chuck, yeah. 
Frank really enjoyed singing. Um, on the left, and somebody can help with the identification. Bauer, Bauer. Okay. Anybody else? Or, uh, Frank's on the right. And Jerry. Uh, Johnny. 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 Oh, Johnny. 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 Okay. Next to Frank Bowes. Okay. <coughs> and then the, he was in, involved with the Methodist Church Men's Choir. Mm -hmm. Frank held many jobs. He managed the St. Clair Theater, taught driver's ed, and was a lifeguard at the swimming pool. He also managed the Magic Square Recreational Facility. He was president of the Lions Club and was, was president of, the, of Region 6 of the Michigan Education Association. And as a sidebar, the, high, the, uh, the theater, boy, you just, you know, he patrolled that upper balcony <laughs> with his flashlight. And so no hanky-panky went on. There was no road in the balcony. No, 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 no. <coughs> did a good job. Does anybody like to have stories about that? <laughs> Nobody's going to cough up any stories, huh? Mm -hmm. Frank married Sally Moulton. Moulton. They raised two daughters, Deborah and Julie, in St. Clair. Now, Frank's apartment, first apartment in 48, was right over here on Riverside. Riverside. The foot of uh, Brown. Brown, yeah. Frank and Shelley Bowles were married 60 years. The day after their anniversary, Frank passed away on June 25th, 2009. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's right. He, he died at the Voyager playing cards. That was, it was a, it, that was a weekly thing. And Sally said to me, he left just like he normally did. He just goodbye, hugged her, kissed her, said, I'll be back. I'm just going to play cards. And, that was it, yeah. Mm -hmm. A week before he passed, he came into the museum and he brought us the Burkhart's Bar baseball cap that's upstairs in the museum. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I had him as, as a teacher, he said, he said, you might not like me now, but someday we'll be friends. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I did get to see him outside of school several times. He told my sister he couldn't understand how somebody could get an A in Spanish and couldn't pass English. <laughs> 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 I got him for driver's head as well as health. I think it was shortly after he had me for driver's head that he gave that up. <laughs> <laughs> I had no concept of driving whatsoever. Well, you left North and South. Well, no direction either. But he um, put me first in the driver's seat, and of course the guys in the back seat were all from farmers and stuff and knew how to drive tractors. I knew nothing. In my mind, in order to get the car to go, you push the accelerator to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> and when you went to stop, you push the brake to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, we went from zero to 60 um, <laughs> <laughs> and back from 60 to zero in three seconds. <laughs> it was back in the day when they had the controls, too, on their side. I think they also invented seatbelts right after <laughs> Yeah, I 
Oh. Did you pass driver's training? Actually, I did. <laughs> <laughs> he taught me very well after that. I needed a little extra. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and it, it doesn't help because my best friend is his daughter. So it's like I get to see him every day. You know, just about it. <laughs> Run into him all the time. And be reminded. <laughs> I remember Frank was, as a night out, I was in his class and sat in the back row, thank God. Sat <laughs> <laughs> in the back, and then you were doing okay. Yeah. But, <laughs> but um, what I really remember most is, it seems like every time I ever went out to Marisol Golf Course, he was there. <laughs> the man lived there. Yeah, he'd be on the first tee, he'd be waiting at the first tee, and me and my brother go up there and. He actually did a golf cart for a while. Yeah. Yeah. So every time I went, I didn't go golfing that much at Marysville, but when I did, he was all there every time. He was in the class, um, like you said, if you were doing good, you were in the back row. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you did really well, you were way in the back, and we always tried it. There was always a little bit of a competition for the first seat. Yeah. But he said the ones in front were his favorite. <laughs> <laughs> and he always wanted to give him a hug and all this kind of stuff. And he always stood there kind of and looking down on the front row. <laughs> and thankfully, I was in the back row, too. <laughs> but he had had our Aunt Shirley. And our dad. So when Nancy and I came along, he was probably like, oh, thank God. Because <laughs> dad was, dad misbehaved. <laughs> Surely he was good. Dad misbehaved. <laughs> okay. Um, Fred Miller, uh, who I understand was the most valuable player in the uh, St. Clair Little League for four years in a row, uh, is, going, is going to talk about Joe Kletcha. Uh, actually, Mr. Kletcha to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I got it. Most men over age 60 um, grew up in St. Clair, knew the name Joe Clutcha because uh, I remember uh, when Little League started and there was no organized baseball in St. Clair at the time. It was just a bunch of guys to get a ball in the back and go play. And I remember we played in Munch uh, Greenhouse's backyard. But along came Joe, and uh, he coached a lot of my friends uh, in the St. Clair Little League program. He played baseball himself. He was on two different teams, and these are the, the pictures. I'm not sure what teams, though. Um, and his, he Coons took was his, one of them. What, what? Coons was one of them. Coons? Yeah. Bernie Coons. 46. There you go. And he... Uh, he took his love for the uh, sport further than most, and uh, the uh, <laughs> 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 I, must, I, I must be doing good. <laughs> <laughs> Joe took his love of the uh, sport further than most. He was part of the start of the St. Clair Little League and was active in it for over 35 years. Um, I remember the first year I uh, I tried out for the little league and uh, uh, all I knew was Joe Clutcha or Mr. Clutcha. That was it. That was the name. Uh, he served as director. <coughs> he was uh, just an average citizen. Uh, husband to Gert, his high school sweetheart, father to Sandy and Diane, and his son JB, uh, who I met and played golf with in Florida. Joe believed in doing something for his kids and uh, hard lurking with them and was part of the St. Clair Recreation Program. One man commented to us as a 10 year old on one of Joe's teams, Joe yanked him off the field for not hustling. He said, let's learn. <laughs> Never happen again. <laughs> Uh, Joe was instrumental in getting the first automatic pitching machine for the Little League. When was that? Early 70s, because I remember them getting it. Yeah, there you go. His teams were all-stars, or kids just learning the game. 
and uh, he instituted uh, the substitution rule. Unfortunately for me, <laughs> a little later in the program, uh, where everybody gets to play at least half the game. Uh, and it was interesting, I was reading an article uh, that uh, all the kids got to bat, and uh, so that was really cool. He felt that baseball should be fun and not all about winning. And uh, there's a playground, Joe Fletcher playground down on Gulf Street. Is that still there? Yeah. 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 There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Joe was, was awarded the Outstanding Citizen of the Year from the St. Clair Rotary Club. Who are those guys? Oh, yeah. Mr. Bowler. Bob Bowler, yeah. Mr. Gilmore on the left. Mr. Bowler, yeah. Joe also received the Governor's Minuteman Award which was given to people who took a minute to tell about the beauty of Michigan, but uh, of course she did a lot more than that. But nice for the governor. Yeah. Yep. After working uh, many years at Ainsworth, he left to become the St. Clair Harbor Master. He made a big impression on many who worked for him. Always, he always stressed keeping the boat harbor clean and taking care of the boater first and foremost. We were talking about that and uh, Everybody said that uh, the boater was the customer and he really did take good care of the marina. Joe Clutcher was a member of St. Mary's Church, the American Legion. He was uh, an original member of the St. Clair Special Police. Joe passed away at the age of 69 on August 26 of 1990. How many, how many people here were in Little League? <laughs> Oh, Bailey. Yeah. <laughs> Joe, you got any stories? Were you good, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 just. <laughs> I know uh, when I when I started Little League that uh, I had a mitt that looked like Ty Cobb played with it. And... Um, <laughs> And because none of us, you know, really had organized baseball, but boy, did we get into it, and it was a lot of fun. It really was. Marching down the street, uh, down the parade, and the little league parade. And I, other than you know, having to pull me out of the game, uh, my, other, <laughs> my other memory of it was you pull up in the station wagon, and he had all of the league's gear in back. And so if you didn't, if you were missing something, you went to went into the car and picked out what you needed. If you didn't have a mitt, or if you didn't have a, your hat, or whatever, you had all the stuff in the car. And uh, also, when he, uh, when I was ten, I, Joe always coached Indians. That was his team, the Indians. And I made his team as a ten-year-old, and. He had never had a losing season until I played for him. Another member of that team was Spike Moore. And he was, he was Spike Moore, a third. <laughs> okay, uh, Georgie Burns is going to. Uh, Talk about Julia Hendricks. This injury. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for us involved in the museum, uh, Julia is basically the, uh, <laughs> the the premier person and the uh, the originator of the uh, St. Clair Historical Commission and one of the key people uh, involved in the Historical Commission and history in St. Clair. Julie was born and raised in St. Clair. She took a job with the Diamond Crystal Salt Company right out of high school. She worked there for seven years and filled in for several years afterward. She and her family were members of St. Mary's Church. She belonged to several organizations, was a teacher, 
president of the Catholic Parents Association, CCD teacher, and also a substitute teacher and organist. Julia came from a big family in McCormick's and they lived across the street from um, St. Mary's. And one of her granddaughters told me that um, Father Cromenacher would socialize with their family. And he had a parlor trick. He'd come and he'd blow smoke out of his ears to entertain the little kids. <laughs> but that's Julia and Charlie and their kids in the first picture. It was uh, Charlie and the youngest one. During World War II, Julia was a Red Cross volunteer and was on the board of rationing. Only us old folks know what that is. She was the first woman on the St. Clair Election Board. She also served on the St. Clair Board of Education. During urban renewal in the 1960s, she was on the City's Planning Commission. She was also a member of the Swimming Pool Commission. She was a Girl Scout leader for many years. She was mine. <laughs> Julia's hobby, in addition to history, was china painting. She had a display of her handiwork at the St. Clair Museum in 1989. Over on the table to the right, we have uh, three of the cups and saucers that she painted and, and donated to us. During urban renewal, Julia was determined to save as much of St. Clair's history as she could. When buildings and homes were being torn down, Julia would go scavenging with her bushel basket, sometimes in the dark with her flashlight, for things to put in the museum collection. She was the founder of the St. Clair Historical Commission and its first chairman in 1967. <coughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> in 1998, Mrs. Hendrick was honored with the Historical Society of Michigan's Award of Merit. She was awarded this honor at a tea held in the Historical Museum. Whew, I don't know how she found the time, but the energy for all this, but this little woman was a mover and a shaker. And that's a picture of a, the historical members at the time. Julie is the second from the left. <coughs> this was the article in the paper about her statewide honor for the Historical Society. No. <laughs> Julia and her husband Charlie had two sons, Charles Jr. and Robert. Charlie died in 1978. When I was, when we went to St. Mary's School, seventh and eighth grade girls, they, used, they had different things in the basement of the school. And one time, her son Charlie came in in his Air Force uniform. And boy, all of us girls thought he was pretty handsome. <laughs> I still think you went to a different school than I did. I did not about high school, but now it's St. Mary's. Yeah, I don't know how you forgot that, Mary Jo. <laughs> we at the St. Clair Historical Museum are very thankful for Julia Hendrick's foresight in saving so much of St. Clair's history during and after urban renewal. And uh, I think we have about 25 or 30 typewriters and uh, of various vintages, and we can thank Julia, I think, for a lot of those and collecting them in our, in our collection here at the museum. Uh, she did collect almost everything and a lot of the uh, artifacts that you see. By the way, the museum is open after the program tonight for those of you who would like to, to see something. Uh, and Georgie did mention some items that are on the table over at the right-hand side of the room uh, to my right. And there are other artifacts related to the various people that uh, we're talking about tonight. So you're welcome after the program to take a look and see those things. Now we have uh, Mary Boda, and she's going to talk about Bernie Kuhn. And I think a lot of people know him um, for a variety of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I'm going to start with Bernie Kuhn. Um, a good friend of our family plus everybody. He was a friend of everybody. He was a generous gentleman's gentleman. He was born December 5, 1920 in Detroit to Gladys and Bernard E. Kuhn. He married Margaret E. Fredericks January 11, 1941 at St. Mary's Church in St. Clair. And over on the table is their wedding picture. They honeymooned in Miami and Cuba. Margaret loved fashion and owned the HERS store in St. Clair for many years. Their children are Barb Bernard, Barbara, and Joellen. 
Margaret preceded Bernie in death March 25, 2015. Bernie served in the U.S. Army from 43 to 46 during World War II. He left the Army in 46 as a staff sergeant. He earned a Good Conduct Medal, a Victory Medal, and Driver and Mechanical Badge. His military occupational specialty was Supply NCO. And there's his on honorable discharge paper and the picture of him back then. He was 19 and Margaret was 21 when they got married. Bernie was the last grandson of Aaron Mendelson, an early auto industry pioneer. Mr. Kuhn came to St. Clair when he was seven years old. He was the owner of Kuhn Sales for 64 years. He was at work there at 6 a.m. every day and never used a computer. Everything was written by hand. He served as president of the Blue Water Auto Dealers and served on Chrysler Dealers Council. Coons Sales and Service sponsored a local baseball team for many years. Bernie's on the right in the white shirt. That's the 1946 state championship team. Bernie would always help whoever needed it. Often teens and widows got help if they needed a car. He was an original organizer of the St. Clair Foundation. When the foundation was having a meeting, my husband, the fire chief, would get a call at night wanting to know what they needed at the fire hall, and Bernie would try to get the money for it. The Coons and the Mendelssohn Foundation donated an equipment truck to the fire department in 1977. And that's Bernie. My father-in-law, and then it's Margaret and Kuhn, then Bud Fredericks, and then Bernie Kuhn in the picture. Bernie was a leader in other ways. He was chairman of River District Hospital Board and served on the board of St. John's Hospital in Detroit. Chairman of St. Clair Boat Harbor Commission for 42 years. During urban renewal, Bernie was a member of the St. Clair Progress Corporation. He was a member of the St. Clair Special Police and the American Legion. And the top picture, of course, construction of Riverview Plaza. Look at the old water tower. 1968. And then Bernie was a lifetime. Whoops. Sorry. <coughs> Bernie was a lifetime member of St. Mary's Catholic Church and a member of Knights of Columbus. He was chairman of Catholic Social Services. And I think he's in that picture. He must Somewhere. be in, in that picture. <laughs> <laughs> he's in the picture. Probably Father Krumenacher in the back. Yeah. 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 That's what I thought that many years ago. Is that in there? No. Bernie's in it. He's top right. Okay. When Laurel Fredericks was the new librarian at St. Mary's School, she saw Bernie at a party and he asked her how she liked her job. She said, fine, but she wished the kids didn't have to sit on a couple of small rugs at story time. A week later, the principal came and told her that Mr. Kuhn called and wanted to pay for two library rooms to be carpeted and that he wanted no recognition for it. He did lots of things for lots of people that we don't know about. He was the mayor of St. Clair from 1988 to 2000. He always wore a suit and tie to council meetings, but was well known for wearing his red sweater also. When Bernie was mayor and my husband was the fire chief, you had to be up early on New Year's Day because Bernie called it, called Happy New Year and thanked you for your service. He would send Merry Christmas letters to city officials, too. Mayor Kuhn performed a thousand weddings and never took anything for his services. Whatever the happy couple gave him went to the city. In 2001, St. Clair dedicated its new city offices and named it the Bernard E. Kuhn Municipal Office Center to honor the man many called Mr. St. Clair or Uncle Bernie, or whatever you want to call him. He was a, a good guy. His love of St. Clair was unwavering, said his daughter, Joellen. He was patient and kind man, according to Bill Cedar. 
He was so aware of the goodness in others and their potential. And that's his son-in-law, Norbert Strzelecki. There's a picture of Bernie in 2014. He died December 15, 2016 at the age of 96. He was born in December and died in December. And over on the table there's a letter that he sent to Bill Shunk back in 1996. We had a lot of rain and a barge got loose from Malcolm, so it's coming down Pine River, back and forth across the river, damage and everything. So Bernie Coons uh, knocking on Bill Shunk's door. Hey, can you do something about this? So Bill got grabbed the rope and started running along the river and finally the barge stopped there by the sewage plant and beavers. There's a little indentation there. It finally stopped. So. Bill Shunk got a rope on it and tied it to something on land and stopped the barge from ruining the bridge and everything. So there's a letter there that Bill Shunk gave me. That So, you know, he was just a very considerate man and thankful for everything. And the kindergarten fire truck ride better go past Coons every morning. Oh, every yes. Day. Yeah. Yeah. If it didn't, you got a call from Bernie yeah, Coons. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot about that, Karen. Yeah. Yeah. Mary, you said that he was a supporter of a lot of things, and that's true. Uh, for St. Mary's, that sponsored the Cub Scouts and the Boy Scouts, he was a very behind the scenes supporter. Wonderful. And he always came to all the Court of Honors for the boys when they made the oh. Scout. He was there, and he made a special point that I like to say, always low key. But they, he really was was very involved. <coughs> what, wonderful, yes. He was like to say, Mr. St. Clair. Yes. You don't find him like that now. That's, he was great. Sorry, he had to go, but anyway, he lived a good long life and did lots of good for lots of people. Anybody else about Bernie? Oh, and one thing about Margaret. She loved her fried St. Clair River walleye. Because yeah. <laughs> if my husband got extra, Margaret got it. Got the extra fish. Okay. Did Margaret die just the year before he did? No, no, it wasn't just the year before. Was it 15 years? Joellen, when did your mom die? 14? Okay, now the next one. Okay, Paul Pulaski is going to talk about uh, <coughs> Hazel Buehler. <coughs> From first-hand experience, correct, Paul? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Most people have heard or have seen Buehler Lumber. It wasn't always Buehler Lumber. It was Buehler Sporting Goods and Lumber Company. It all started when John Buehler bought a garage for $50 and had it moved to the river where the Voyager parking lot is now. They rented the spot for $5. John A. Buehler started the company with his wife Hazel. That's where they had the Buehler boat livery. <coughs> Hazel was from a retail business family from Marine City that owned BB Hardware Store. Hazel was one of the four sisters. John Beaver died in June of 1956 at a relatively young age in his early 50s. Hazel was left a widow with six children, most of them near adulthood. Fred was already married to Martha Targ Kors. She was also left with running the family business. Beaver Sporting Goods was a successful company that supplied sporting goods, fishing tackle, and equipment and boasts to retailers around the state. In the 1950s, it was rare for a woman to run a company, but Hazel was determined and a hard-working woman. Many say she drove a hard bargain and was not easy to work for. I attest to that. <laughs> <laughs> but she was a true businesswoman, and she was very compassionate. That is right. That picture was taken behind the Sherman House. Decided. Or decided, excuse me. Yeah, that's, she's standing in front of their home. In the early days, there were salesmen who went all over the state pre-selling items. The salesmen were always spent, always sent to the big sporting goods shows and conventions in Chicago. 
The company employed drivers to make the deliveries to town, down, downtown Detroit and other locations all over Michigan. That was mo one of my assignments. The, the Beavers lived in the old Simon Langell homes, which is the current site of Moore Boathouse on South River and Fort. The house was divided in two with the business on one side and the family living on the other. Later they moved to Brown Street and Hazel eventually lived on Oakland Avenue on the St. Clair River. Now the Sherman house is the one on the right, the large uh, three-story building, and Beavers lived in the one just south of that, which eventually became all of their uh, business um, buildings. Hazel had four sons would all be involved with the business. Hazel and Fred took care of the business end. Dick was the lumber guy. Jack was in charge of fishing and hunting. And the youngest son, Bob, started working delivering wood at an age 14. When he asked what he did, when he, he asked what he did at Beaver's, he say, I sell fish hooks. <laughs> Mrs. Hazel Beaver oversaw it all. The two Beaver daughters were not involved in the company in those days. It was the sons who became the businessmen. Hazel Viewer passed away in 1982. I worked immediately for um, Jack Viewer, which had most of the uh, sales in the northern part of Michigan and in the thumb. And Jack, if he knew you, he'd just say, how you doing today, Huckle Huckleberry? <laughs> and eventually he'd just call you Huck when he got to know you. Um, We don't. Okay. Um, I worked for Beavers from the spring of 1960 to 1962, and I started out working for Jack. I, I made deliveries in the Thumb and then to Northern Michigan. And at times, Mrs. Beaver and I would work on loading my truck. She wouldn't be doing the loading. She'd be sitting in the the lounge chair, which what, what it was was a boat chair, and it said Ma B were on the <laughs> back side of the, beer, uh, the chair, and I'd be pulling orders, and many times we'd work until 2, 2.30 in the morning. I'd give her a ride home, and then I'd leave in the morning for the north. Uh, it was a very good job. I, I made a good income. I was able to work seven days if I'd liked to work that long, and I only worked in the summertime because during the, during the uh, fall, winter, and spring I was in school. The last time I worked for Beavers was at Christmas time in 1962, and Hazel gave me a call, I didn't call her Hazel, but <laughs> <laughs> she, gave, she gave me a call at home and she said, can you run a load up to Traverse and Petoskey? And um, I said, well, I got, I've got exams next week. I said, I've got to be home Saturday night, and, she, and I had Friday off. And so I left on Friday, and we always got the, Jack and I always got the worst trucks to the north. Uh, everything that was nice went into Detroit, I guess is to impress the customer, but um, I got as far as, as Claire, and it was snowing out, and the truck broke down. Uh, we got it going again. I got it uh, by myself, and I had it towed in that Claire. And I got to Traverse City, and it broke down again. So I had a place that I used to deal with up there, because we always, always were having breakdowns, and uh, mm -hmm. I left it in his garage. He re, uh, put some new wiring on it, new coil, mm -hmm. and I left in the morning. I got up to about Acme, and the state police were there, and they said, all the roads to the north are closed. And I said, what do you mean closed? Well, they're having whiteouts, and we're not letting any traffic go through. And I said, when can I get up there? And they said, probably Sunday midday. Well, I had to be back to St. Clair. So I still had a half a load, and I, I left and drove home, and I got down south of Bay City, and the hood came up on the truck, <laughs> smashed the windshield, so I got, I got the hood tied down, uh, I continued home, dropped the truck off, and by then it was 7 o'clock in the evening at Beewers, and the next morning uh, after Mass, the phone rings, and my mother says, Mrs. Beaver wants to talk to you. <laughs> I, uh, I got on the phone, and she says, uh, what'd you do to my truck? <laughs> said, That's not what you should be concerned about. The merchandise that I was to deliver up north, only half of it got there. And she says, you're fired. <laughs> and that's the last time I saw her, but I met my late wife there. And um, when we got married, um, our reception, the whole Beaver clan was there. And she, 
my mom was there and, and she forgot all about it. But uh, it, it was a good job. I enjoyed working there. I learned a lot about merchandising. Um, it was just, it was nice working at Beavers. <laughs> and, Anybody have any? I have one story. He's a viewer with my grandmother. <laughs> I remember you. <laughs> I was in the seat, coming in to see your, your dad and your mom. Yeah. And we used to have a company down in Detroit make wooden billy clubs for the police departments. And so the drivers in Detroit that would do that route, they'd pick them up and they'd be in 55 gallon drums. And I remember, and, and anybody in Hazel, you know, she was a big woman. And um, two guys are trying to get that barrel off the back of that truck, and Hazel walked up and says, Get the hell out of the way, wrap your arms around it, and set it on the floor. Anybody else? Okay, thanks, Paul. Yep. And Chrissy? <coughs> you have to switch uh, thumb? You have to switch thumb drive? Yep. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Chrissy, are you staying where you are? Uh, no, I'll probably come back. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Hello. <laughs> Unlike my friends, I, I didn't know the people that I'm reporting on, so <laughs> so you can fill in the blanks. So I am doing Sarah Langley. Miss Sarah Langley was from Canada. She came to St. Clair in 1937 after Miss Tuckley retired. She took up residence in the apartment above the hospital just like Nurse Tuckley. By all accounts, she was devoted totally to the hospital and the people in the community. The hospital was opened in April of 1927, so it was just 10 years old when Langley took over. This hospital was located on the southeast corner of 5th and Trumbull on this lot that we're on right now. Um, you can see the museum and the Baptist church in the background there. She often helped with the cooking for the hospital and frequently canned fruits and vegetables for hospital use. Her duties also included keeping records, watching the finances, taking all the x-rays, acting as hospital pharmacist, and occasionally baking her special coconut cake for patients with birthdays. She remained at the hospital until it closed in 1965. She then moved to Toronto where she became the housekeeper for a large Roman Catholic parish. Dr. Garretts was very fond of Miss Langley. We doctors expected a lot out of Miss Langley. We had no specialists, so when a baby was born early and in a precarious condition, we turned it over to Miss Langley. She had her own regimen of care and feeding, but supplemented frequently by phone calls to a senior pediatrician in Port Huron. I don't know how to say that, Dr. Baddeley. <laughs> These informal and uncompensated consultations went on for years. Today, many a former preemie, now a husky healthy adult, owes his or her life to that program. Richard and Mary Lumley agreed. I, I've gotten a lot of my stuff from Facebook when I asked, so that's where I'm quoting this from. My mom always said, if it was not for her, you would not be here today. Preemie just under four pounds. She took real good care of her babies. Miss Langley was a fervent Catholic, a member of the Third Order of St. Francis, just one step below a nun. If a baby didn't look like they were going to make it to Miss Langley, it was baptized by her professionally and immediately. She would say, don't bother about the family's religion or intentions. No time to waste in helping this little soul into the kingdom of heaven. Dr. Garrett again. 
There were fortunately no medical lawsuits at the time. It wasn't the fashion yet, and Miss Langley had all of us, and all of us were able to do what we thought best without fear of legal consequences. On the subject of doing the right thing, let's introduce the last Justice of the Peace in St. Clair, Jerry Emick. Jerry, shown here as his 90th birthday party, was also on Miss Langley's phone list. If Nurse Langley could talk a fellow into marrying the girl in the hospital having the baby, and apparently she could. <laughs> you want to marry this girl, Jerry would ask? Yes. Why do you want to marry her? Because my nurse Langley told me. <laughs> now, if Nurse Langley could talk him into getting married before the baby was born, everything was set. However, if she couldn't until after the baby was born, why she would just reverse the dates on the marriage and her <laughs> so that that child would not be illegitimate. <laughs> Can you raise your hand if you know that this went on? Does anybody know that the, I mean, Jerry Amick told us this story. <laughs> that she, does it sound like something she would do? Yeah. <laughs> now, if Nurse Langley needed blood at the hospital, this is a quote from Jack Stubbs on Facebook. The gas station my father ran on Riverside and Witherall a few blocks from the hospital. I remember my father telling the story of the hospital needing blood because of the surgery. Miss Langley phoned the gas station and told them about the emergency. He temporarily closed the gas station, leading his entire crew and all the customers he could corral to donate blood. Miss Langley had the character to be able to command that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Apparently, she could get things done, says Kevin Cameron. My mother, Virginia Cameron, worked for Miss Langley. Since they lived um, close to the hospital, Archie Cameron got the task of a lot of maintenance work, pay off a good home-cooked meal for Miss Langley. Speaking of food, Sheila Chartier, my mom gave birth to my sister on her 21st birthday. Miss Langley baked her a cake, and my mom never forgot the kindness. Robert Shuffler. Hmm. My father was in the hospital in 1940, and she used to bake him lemon pie because it was his favorite. Hmm. I also worked there in 1949, cleaning up and washing floors. She would come down from her apartment upstairs and bring us, her boys, as she called us, cookies. Georgie Burns. Miss Langley was a wonderful woman who ruled the hospital and the doctors with the iron, iron fist and the velvet glove. There was no doubt she was the boss. She made our dad German chocolate cake. <laughs> now, I don't know how she's getting all the bacon and the x-rays. <laughs> that's, that's what I don't know. It wasn't that busy. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> Bobby Claus. I remember visiting only as far as the lobby. She always gave me an apple. Like, we didn't have enough apples in our orchard in the back. <laughs> Sis Johnson, one evening after visiting hours, she came into the room with hot fudge sundaes for my roommate and me. Yeah. Miss Langley also had a cook for some time named Viola Codlin. We were told she used a kitchen in the basement to cook for the patients. Claudia Flemingoff. My grandparents lived on 4th Street between J and Orchard Street. My Aunt Teresa Miro came was a tray girl. She delivered lunch to the, and dinner to the patients while in high school. My grandmother, Laura Miro, made divinity fudge for the patients at the holidays. So we knew Miss Langley well. No dress-up situation. Easter First Communion was exempt. I had to be seen and improved and approved by Miss Langley. We would visit her apartment upstairs and I had to twirl. She'd check my crinolines, my shoes. On my Aunt Teresa's wedding day, the entire wedding party stopped by to see Miss Langley because she was working, but she wanted to see the bride, the bridesmaids, and me, the flower girl. <laughs> Miss Langley ran the hospital for 28 years. Here she is being honored by Senator Frank Beadle at the board and the board of the hospital, thanking her for her many years of service. The honorary dinner was held at the St. Clair Inn. Her last patient, little Scott McDonald, was her last official day at the hospital. After the hospital closed, she and her assistant tagged and documented $55,000 of, of hospital equipment to be donated and moved to the New River District Hospital. 
the board also authorized $28,000 in trust funds for the new hospital. Ms. Sarah Langley was honored with Langley Circle being named after her in the late 1960s. Jerry Emick probably had something to do with that. After leaving St. Clair, Ms. Langley moved to Toronto and became head housekeeper at a large Catholic parish in Toronto. Years later, Dr. Garrett and his wife recalled taking her longtime friend and employee, Sel Selma Rosenberg, to <coughs> Toronto for a visit. The joyous reunion brought tears to her eyes. They were again inseparable for the two days we remained in Toronto. Um, this is part of her obituary from over there. She died in Wesley Hospital, Toronto, and is buried in St. Paul's Cemetery, Alliston, Ontario. So, uh, anybody like stories about uh, Mary Jo? You want to tell? Uh, well, our first son was being born, and I was in the service at the time in Salford, and I was in the hospital here with Bonnie, and uh, it was getting close to the time, and of course I wanted to be there because we were kind of concerned. But she said, Timothy, you know you should be going to church. Now you go on. You just go on. Now there'll be plenty of time. <laughs> Baby was born when I come back, you know, so <laughs> she got me out of her hair. Mine is more a story on her. I was born, my mother said I was the ugliest baby she ever saw, I was blue, and she said the only time in my life I was thin, she said, and she said I had this clunk on my head, and she asked Dr. McPherson, what's the matter with her head? Oh, Miss Langley dropped her on her head. Thank you over there. <laughs> Speak up, Glenn. Well, I never really knew her. I was one of her preemies um, in 1962. I was 4'4", four, four, and as noted up there, now hefty and... Must have been her home cooking house. Yeah. Yeah. I know I was, I was in the hospital. I know for the first month of my life I was in the hospital. Hmm. She must have been there. Anybody else? When they were playing baseball right out here, uh, little kids, you know, because the uh, where the where Fifth Street, where the house right across the street is, that was home plate. So this would have been like left field, but you had to be careful because the hospital stuck out on the end, and if you hit a foul ball, it would go through the uh, into the maternity ward. <laughs> Yeah. But and and at the time there was a house right over here for the member of the old Baptist uh, mm -hmm. the, the house. Yeah, right. and we couldn't hit it that far either, so we were cold. Well, I hit a foul ball and I really smacked it, and it went right through the window in the maternity ward. Oh. Oh. So I'm thinking, uh oh, <laughs> <laughs> I know this lady. <laughs> so I go up and I and I went into the front, and you can't, you can only go through the front door. That's it. And then there's some steps going up, and you stand there and wait till somebody shows up. <laughs> I told her what I did, and she says, "Oh, that's okay, Freddie. Don't worry about it. But don't play ball here anymore." <laughs> hey, Fred, Fred, tell them about how you lived right there and what you heard. <laughs> oh well, um, in the summer because there was no air conditioning, a lot the windows in the hospital would be open. <coughs> And the delivery room was right over there. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I felt sorry for those people. <laughs> <laughs> because it sure wasn't pleasant. <laughs> and sometimes it was long. <laughs> but you know, that was your neighborhood. <laughs> when, I, when I was uh, I was out at a, at a summer camp and uh, I had appendicitis and collapsed. And they brought me home in the school bus, which I never did understand because <laughs> nobody was home. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, they called, they called Dr. Beer, and Dr. Beer came over and took one look at me and picked me up and carried me across the street and operated on me with Miss Langley there and took my appendix out right then. <laughs> so, you know, this is. It's a great place to grow up. <laughs> <laughs>
And our, Chrissy's going to do our last person, uh, Katie Balfour. Oh boy. No. <laughs> no, Chrissy never met Katie Balfour, but Chrissy's scared of her. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> I have heard a lot of stories. So, so, you know, I mean, I remember hearing stories about old man Langell, too, and how everybody's afraid of him, and, you know, there's always that haunted house. So I'm like, okay, maybe, you know, maybe this is just teenage drama we're talking about, and, um, so that's what I was hoping to find, and, and this is a good story. <laughs> Catherine J. Balfour was born February 5, 1907, in Cleveland, Ohio. So that's her and the kids. She's on the right there. Those are her siblings. She's from the class of 1924. Oh, how we laughed when we read, Katie did. But hasn't our kitty done more than Katie did? <laughs> Ms. Bill's first class of 1924 was the second class to graduate from the new high school on 6th Street. She would have also attended the old one that once stood on the same property. In 1926, Katie Belfort and her friend Alex McDonald from the class of 1922 hitchhiked to Colorado. Probably something a lot of people don't know. <laughs> um, David Belfort told me this. Somewhere there's a picture of them at Pike's Peak. <laughs> and he doesn't know any, any more the, of the story than that. So that's pretty courageous at that time to be venturing out. Talk around town has always been that she was left at the altar, and that's why she was hot-headed and lost her temper. The real story, coming from her first cousin once removed, David Belfort, she wasn't left at the altar. Yes, to the best of our knowledge, she expected a marriage to be with partnership when it came to making decisions. No husband was going to make all the major decisions, and she was going to have a career as well as her husband. She was not going to live in the 19th century. We don't know who called off the wedding or who the young man was. It could have been someone she met as a student at Western. So she graduated um, from Western State Teachers College and then returned to St. Clair. Uh, Bobby Claus quotes, at first, if at first you don't succeed, succeed, find the reason why, then try, try again. Teresa Clore also quotes her, have an idea, make a plan, work your plan, and then evaluate the plan. Something like that. It was and still is good advice. That's from the 1953 yearbook of her and a student sewing machine. Um, I just added some of these pictures of the old high school so you guys could remember back. Some of them don't have, you know, they might not have been her room or whatever. Even more sound advice. Susan Alley Wilson, she would tell us, don't smoke. I bought a car with what I saved by not smoking. <laughs> by the time Rochelle Tomlin was in school, I was able to go on vacation because I didn't spend money smoking. I think it was Japan that she went to, too. Sarah Flum, don't forget the admonishment to sit up straight. Sit up straight, don't slouch. Chris Starkey, is that? Okay. <laughs> Miss Balfour told us to always wipe off the top of the cans before opening them because rats ran over them in the warehouse. <laughs> I still wipe the cans to this day. <laughs> Don't marry too. <laughs> I didn't have her for home that. <laughs> I had Mrs. Cornish. The thrifty Katie Balfour, Lynn McQuarrie, waste not, want not, teaching us to be thrifty by mixing powdered milk and regular milk. <laughs> <laughs> Pat Kennedy. Katie had about 20 dresses made from the same pattern and always wore a brooch that looked like a spider. Also, we thought she had three breasts until one day she pulled a huge lot of Kleenex out of her bra. <laughs> she also taught us how to measure lard and sift the bull weevils out of the flower. What an education. This was seconded by Betty Fenner at the museum, um, who talked about the bow weasels just last Tuesday. 
and um, the leftover flour it sat all summer and then they would sift it. She also remembers the baking powder biscuits and flying them from the first floor down there, <laughs> third to the first floor. The 1958 yearbook was dedicated to Miss Balfour. Jeannie Bumgarden Keene, baking powder biscuits, didn't we all have to cook a meal for the boys? Kathy Schwartz Luckovich, cream tuna, hard boiled eggs and peas is every 8th grade boy's ideal meal. I bet they begged their mamas to make it for them after that. Don Barnum, when I was in 8th grade, of course, all the boys had to take home ec. As part of the class, the boys had to make a meal for the girls. Being in charge of dessert, we decided to make chocolate pudding with a twist. I had the guys get a bag of plastic insects, ants, grubs, beetles, and spiders. I directed them to place one or two in each small dish and mix them in with the pudding. This is a picture of Mrs. Pajamon, but I just want you to. I just want you guys to see the kitchen behind it too. As they were eating their dessert and grading our performance, suddenly one of the girls screamed. She found an ant. Another found a spider, and a chain reaction of horror and screams came from the girls. Katie began checking the bowls and demanded that they be taken to the sink immediately. She made my team wash them and retrieve the plastic insects. The fellows who were assigned to do the side dish of mashed potatoes put about a quarter cup of salt in them. Her comment was that they should have been less salty. The guys blamed it on misreading the ingredients and put it and, um, put in a dump instead of a dash of salt. <laughs> no one misread anything. Bob Banning, oh my, the boys in 8C were brutal to Miss Balfour. My mother was teaching fifth grade across the hall, so no way I could participate. Lots of stories, but the timers would be set on all the stoves as class was settling in, only to go off various times as she was speaking of the tape. <laughs> I wonder why the woman was crying. <laughs> I'm upset a lot. <laughs> oh, see about that. Here's some angry moments. Rochelle Tallman. I had Miss Balfour. She said, damn it, excuse my French to me once, but rightly so. I put food down the wrong side of the sink, which did not have the garbage disposal. Debbie Fraser voice. I had Katie Balfour in junior high. I think we had four or five girls in our group. We made a lemon meringue pie, accidentally put in one cup of salt instead of a teaspoon. She thought we had done it on purpose. Boy, was she mad. She made us eat the whole thing. <laughs> I remember how nasty it was. <laughs> Lynn McQuarrie. I started cooking at an early age. When I was 11, I prepared the family Thanksgiving dinner by myself. Rather than using a cutting board to slice an onion, I would just cut across, onion still in hand. Miss Belfour walked by as I was doing so and about had a heart attack. Oh no, that's not how you dice an onion, she exclaimed. Class, this is a perfect example of what not to do. Never ever cut up towards yourself when you're using a knife. Jean Baumgarten Keene. And remember the counting to ten? When she got upset with us, she had to count to ten. Then pulled the Kleenex out of the bra. <laughs> Helen Haney Dittmore. I was afraid of Miss Belfort. She would scream at us if we made a mistake, but I still have her lemon and cranberry nut res bread recipe. Now, I tried to get that recipe. I didn't get that one, but I, I got the butterscotch bonbons. I made that today. And then I made tuna salad and I put eggs in it. Now, no peas? It, it doesn't, I put peas in it too, yeah. But um, then we have them crackers, but it, it's no big deal. <laughs> I'm thinking, it didn't have the cream on top of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm going, I'm going to use real mayonnaise. Yeah. No, this, that, that was just the cream spread out over it. It was the soupiness over that. No, no, no. no. Well, well, somebody explained to me that, that there was the, on the toast was the warm stuff, and this was a salad that she put the eggs in. Do you guys, did she put the eggs in the, in the warm stuff, too? 
All right, maybe next time. <laughs> Vic Kurzakowski, I still have the three pocket apron she taught us to sew in class. Teresa Cork, she kept mine. I guess she really liked it. <laughs> David Scott and Sherry Jilson, I still have mine too. They both said the exact same thing. John? Yeah, Peru. Peru. Yeah. For whatever reason, it took me about five weeks to make my friggin' apron. Now, if anybody knows John, that's not a surprise. During the switchover session, when the boys took home ec and the girls took shop with Mr. Johnson back in the spring of 1967, David Balfour. She was a devoted member of the Methodist Church and willing we gave up her time and money with no expected thanks. She was particularly mindful mindful of the needs of the young people in the church. If books were lacking, she bought them. If a room needed to be run, redone for them, she had it done. She did those things and, and insisted people did not know that it was she who gave the money. Although she was very active in high school, she wasn't in college. Why? She worked, and when her younger sister at Margaret entered Western, Margaret was involved in numerous activities, president of a number of organizations, while Katie worked to help support her. This was typical of Katie all her life. She helped her siblings, nieces, nephews, and num on numerous occasions. Christine Eckleberry. Not only was Katie my home ec teacher, she was also my Sunday school teacher. She taught 19 out of 23 of my cousins <coughs> and my father and his eight brothers and sisters. I believe she taught math to them. Did she live in that whole house by herself? No. no. Was it apartments then, yeah. too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Her father helped her turn it into apartments. Yeah. Um, she was born February 1907, February 5th, and she died February 6th, 2002. She's at Hillside Cemetery. Okay, anybody have any uh, comments they'd like to add about the uh, <coughs> oh boy. No, no. <laughs> I got to get this out. This is my brother's story. He called me on the way up here from Oregon. And Catherine Belfort, 1962, the boys switched. One semester the girls had and then the boys. And so he had he was in the seventh grade and he had about twenty eight kids in the class, boys. And their first thing they were gonna make was nut ball coffee cake. And boys at that age, they just went to listen. And they laughed and they were laughing so hard and she got mad at him and said, You boys don't need to think that way. <laughs> But he said every time she said the words, all the boys just about went up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was my story about Jesus. Can you give us that recipe? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he said it really was pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, it's like toilet jokes. <laughs> yeah. Who all had? Who all had Miss Belfort? Oh, <laughs> who didn't have Miss Belfort? <laughs> 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 and my mother did also. Oh, she did. Yeah. yeah. What is, I'm sorry. What? Her and her mother. My mother and I had her. Oh, your mother and you? Yeah. Do you have any stories? No. <laughs> <laughs> One girl I put on Facebook that she just got kicked out of the class. Was she a me? And and she, and Katie was doing the. Um, she's like, you're a me. Get out of here. <laughs> Georgie, is that who it was? Okay, yeah. Okay. Are we on? Chuck, did you want to wrap up or anything? Or? I can. You know, we had a, a red. Davenport in the office. I worked in the office for many years when he was teaching. And she really liked the boys. They could get away with murder. 
But the girls, there wasn't an hour when she wouldn't bring girls in to sit on that Davenport. And every time she'd come in, I can see her yet, she'd have her apron and she'd be doing this. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what Barnum said. He said, we never got failed and we never got in trouble or, you know. No. Yeah. But she was a good teacher. I, our Julie could mimic her like anything. <laughs> I used to say, you just keep your mouth shut. You don't know what she's got to say. <laughs> Where was the sewing room? When right she across talked. from the office to the yeah, west. Yeah, yeah. Right across Mrs. Bain's room. And across from Mrs. Stein's classroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, across yeah. from the office, but but across in the back of the building. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Back in all there. If you were going in the old part of the building, it was <laughs> down the middle and to the right yeah. and all that part. Okay. How about a round of applause for all of the three actors?